Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Nicola Piras, and welcome to the inaugural colloquium of the 2022 spring session of the Half Baked Online Colloquia Series. This series uh, is part of the activities of Culinary Mind, a leading international center promoting philosophical thinking on food. This series is organized by Andrea Borghini, Megan Dean, Beatrice Serini, and uh, yours truly. Uh, the series uh, aims to highlight new work on philosophical issues that pertain to food and eating practices, to spark discussion and debate, and to connect scholars working in this area. Uh, if you want to retrieve videos of our past events, you can visit our webpage in the media section. And uh, if you want to stay up to date on the news on Culinary Mind, please subscribe to our mailing list on our webpage or text us. Uh, now, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Jeremy Lafrère. Uh, Jeremy is a cognitive scientist who leads the food cognition group at Institut Paul Bocuse in uh, Lyon, France. He did his PhD in cognitive philosophy at the Institut Jean Nicot in Paris, and his main research interests lie in conceptual development in preschoolers, food categorization, and multisensory perception of flavor. The title of uh, his talk today is uh, The Varieties of Food Concept. So the floor is yours, uh, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, today, um, today I'm struggling with my computer, so I don't know why, but I cannot. Oh, yeah, okay, it's working. So, so I entitled my work, my um, presentation the varieties of food concepts and the first thing uh, I wanted to mention is that I, I'm not sure I'm a I'm a philosopher anymore I'm, I'm doing more cognitive psychology so I will talk about food concepts but from a, a cognitive psychology perspective but um, I, I will try to make connections between the, the findings we obtain uh, in the, our research on conceptual development in young children and some uh, contemporary debates about, uh, about concepts in uh, general. So as uh, Nicolas said, uh, I'm leading a small group in a bizarre research center, which is called the Institute Paul Bocuse Research Center, a center dedicated to the, the investigation of food behavior, food, food perception. And my main uh, area of uh, interest is categorization, uh, conceptual development in the food domain. And so uh, um, I published uh, and I supervised a couple of uh, students uh, on this topic. And now I have the opportunity to co-supervise uh, Matteo with, uh, with Andrea uh, to uh, investigate a bit uh, deeper food concepts from a, a more philosophical perspective. So leading the food cognition group, and I wanted just to, as a starting point, to just be explicit about what I mean by cognition. Uh, uh, well, as you probably know, investigating cognition, well, it's completely debatable, of course, but investi cognition means to investigate uh, mental representations in the mind and uh, mental operations on those uh, representations. And why we, we do that in the food domain, because certain, uh, as I will, uh, show you certain facets of uh, food behavior are too complex to be only explained from um, your past exposure to a food environment. You need to uh, add an additional level of explanation or analysis, uh, which corresponds to this uh, food cognition level, basically mental representations and mental operations. So uh, in this diagram, you you see that we combine the measurement of mental operations, mental abilities, with uh, an investigation of uh, the mental representations uh, to, uh, to explain certain complex food behaviors. And I, I will uh, give you an example of such a complex food behavior. But first, I wanted to be also explicit about the, what I mean by concepts, because as you know perfectly, uh, this word is uh, tricky and sometimes ambiguous. So in, in this talk, uh, I will use concepts or conceptual knowledge or categories in a, well, interchangeably, even if, well, there is 
plenty of literature about the distinction between concepts and categories, and this distinction is important, but uh, I'm not sure it is important for the, the talk of today, but uh, we will have like the question session discuss that. And I will also tacitly assume that distinguishing between uh, types of concepts is an important task when you have to explain uh, certain complex behaviors. And then by concepts, I will refer to knowledge structures or bodies of uh, knowledge that allow us basically to organize sensory information into objects we can refer to, to categorize or group things into classes, to draw inductions, like to generalize a property based on the category membership, to make analogies, etc. And I, I will investigate the concept through the measurement of these uh, sub-abilities, categorization, induction, analogies in young children, as we will see. So the first part of my talk is dedicated to taxonomic food concept, which is a special type of food concepts we, we investigated. And uh, taxonomic concepts, just uh, again to, to be sure we are relying on the same uh, definition, well, there, there are these types of concepts that are characterized by a conceptual hierarchy kind of structure. Uh, I illustrated that with the, this uh, structure in which uh, apples fall into the food category that falls into the food uh, category. And generally, when we discuss taxonomic concepts or categories, we are distinguishing between uh, like superordinate level versus basic level versus subordinate level. And the tacit assumption is that the basic level is the, the by default mode of categorization. If I throw you an object and you tell me just stop throwing me apples, it means that you are categorizing by default this object as apples uh, more than as a renderenet, which is a very special type of apple. I'm from Normandy, so I'm, I'm, I know a lot of, about apples, but anywhere you, you can translate it into. Italian examples quite easily. So, so, so these taxonomy concepts, they are characterized by this kind of structure, plus the fact that um, uh, category membership is feature-based. The idea is that there is some kind of similarity computation ongoing between the properties of an object and the properties that feature in the content of the taxonomy category. And if there is a decent match, the object is categorized with that taxonomic category. So it's not the case, category membership is not always functioning like that, as I will, as I will say. So we started to, to investigate from, a, let's say, a, a developmental perspective, taxonomic concepts in the food domain, so in kids, to explain a, a, a bizarre behavior, which is the so-called food neophobia. So I will be quick about food neophobia, just to give you the reason why we started this program about conceptual development in, in the food domain. So, it's a, a bizarre behavioral disposition that is supposed to occur between three and six or seven years, old, years of age. And it's a, the fear, literally the fear or the rejection of food perceived as novel or unfamiliar from the kid's point of view. And it, uh, it became a big uh, a hot topic in public health uh, because this uh, type of rejection based on the visual appearance of the food targets uh, fruits and vegetables. So it's a barrier to healthy eating, blah, blah, blah. And so there is a great deal of attention to understand why the uh, young children exhibit this kind of uh, rejection at that precise moment of their development. And so our job was to see if there was some kind of connection between the, the dev conceptual development in the food domain and the intensity of this food uh, rejection. The, the idea was that, uh, of course, you tend to reject a lot of uh, food because they appear to, to you as novel when you have like a poor system of knowledge about food. So it was the reason why we investigated the, the system of knowledge about food in young children. And we started with the taxonomic knowledge. I hope it's, um, it's clear. So we, we set up a first a PhD uh, project to, to, to dig into this uh, uh, suspected relationship between conceptual development and, uh, and food neophobia. And uh, another thing I wanted to, to tell you is that since we were like uh, developmental psychologists or cognitive psychologists, we, 
generally we infer the properties of the, the taxonomic categories from the performance in categorization task. So we first conducted the categorization task to derivatively infer like the maturity of the taxonomic uh, uh, system of knowledge about food. So to give you an example of the categorization task we, we conducted, uh, uh, I'll give you this, uh, this task we published in uh, Cognitive Development a couple of uh, years ago. It was very simple. The task was we, the children, they were asked to, to discriminate between uh, vegetable and fruits. Fruits were the distractor. So basically, they had to put the vegetable in the vegetable box and the other stuff in the other stuff box and the other stuff. They were like the, the fruits exemplar we uh, presented to kids. And we manipulated the, the typicality of the color to adjust the level of difficulty of the task because we were interested in an analysis of errors, but anyway. And so what we observed in that uh, experiment is that there was a, a, a nice relation between age and uh, discrimination discriminability uh, abilities in young children, unexpected one, of course, when the, the, the child uh, is, uh, when the children were older, of course, they exhibited like better performance in that task. It means that they, their taxonomic categories, fruits and vegetables were more like, uh, I don't know, mature or developed. And uh, it was uh, far more complicated for, for, for children from two to four years. So a developmental finding, unexpected one. But we also found a, a, a relationship between uh, their discrimination abilities and the intensity of the food neophobia score. So we confirm our hypothesis that by measuring an ability that heavily depends on the taxonomic categories about food, we were able to predict to a certain extent, as usual, uh, the intensity of uh, the food rejection behavior in uh, children. So it was the first, um, actually, it was the first time uh, a kind of food scientist demonstrated that cognitive factors, such as like the development of taxonomic knowledge about food, uh, played an important uh, role in the explanation of the complex facets of food behavior. So it, uh, it was a good reason to pursue this um, research program. Then we replicated the funding. We set up another uh, PhD project. Uh, I co-supervised with a, a colleague from the a lab in, in France. Uh, and uh, we tested uh, uh, other, sorry, uh, other taxonomic categories. This time at a superordinate level, we wanted to, to determine if the ability um, to distinguish between food and non-food in children was kind of related to this same uh, uh, behavior of uh, food neophobia. And so we conducted uh, another discrimination task. And we again uh, confirmed uh, under certain conditions, but I will spare you the, 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 the details, that there was a, a significant relation between the maturity of the taxonomic system about food and um, food versus non-food and uh, the intensity of the food rejection. So again, food concepts uh, matter when it comes to predict uh, food behavior. But um, of course, when you are interested in concepts, you cannot uh, assume that uh, the only ability that gives you information about uh, the, the properties of, of concepts is uh, categorization. Actually, we use concepts for a variety of uh, tasks, of things. And so we wanted to conceptually replicate our finding by testing another ability in children that uh, depends upon the taxonomic uh, system of, uh, uh, of knowledge. And this uh, other ability is uh, inductive reasoning. So it's the ability to generalize property based on category membership. So we conducted uh, another experiment we published in a journal of, um, uh, of what? Of cognitive psychology. And we relied on a very standard uh, paradigm. Maybe you heard about it. It, uh, it is uh, a paradigm that was invented in the 80s by uh, Suzanne Gelman and Helen Markman uh, to, to 
ou American developmentalist who are well known in the field of conceptual development. And it's the so-called uh, conflicting triad uh, paradigm. So it's uh, illustrated by the, the, the bizarre triad uh, at the bottom left of my, of my screen. So basically, you introduce um, uh, a food item like the tomato. So let's assume for the sake of the experiment that the tomato is a vegetable. From the kid's point of view, a tomato is a vegetable. So we are not doing like botanic or biology. Let's assume it's a vegetable, right? Uh, sorry, I should have selected an a non-controversial example, but anyway, a vegetable is a, a, a tomato is a vegetable. So you ascribe to the tomato a property, like uh, uh, for instance, uh, this referring to the tomato contains zulin. Zulin is a blank property, a property that doesn't exist to, to avoid any background knowledge effect. But just you ascribe a property and the task is very simple. You ask the child, which of these two uh, items this one or that one also contains zulin. And the prediction is that if you have a full-fledged or a mature uh, system of taxonomic categories, you tend to rely on taxonomic category membership to generalize the property. It means that in that task, you will generalize the zulin to the pumpkin because both pumpkin and tomato fall into the taxonomic category. But if your system of uh, taxonomic categories is not uh, is too sketchy or, or not uh, ready yet, you will tend to rely on a by default strategy, which is to uh, rely on perceptual similarity to generalize the property. So it means that here you will tend to generalize contain zulin to something that is also round and reddish, so the apple, even if tomato and apple fall into different taxonomic categories from the kid's point of view, okay? And so uh, again, with this induction reasoning, uh, uh, inductive reasoning tasks, we replicated our findings. We found a robust relationship between uh, performance, induction performance, and the intensity of rejection. When you tend to reject a lot of objects because they appear to you as novel, you tend to exhibit poor performance compared to uh, children that are less uh, picky or less neophobic about, uh, about, uh, about food. So, so it was a, a kind of a conceptual replication of our, our, our previous uh, findings. Now I move to the, the second part of my presentation because you, you could say, okay, you are interested in food concepts, but uh, you just uh, investigated a very particular family of food concepts, like the taxonomic one, but there are plenty of other types of food concepts. And we, we were fully aware of that. And so we decided to extend our research program to another types of uh, concepts about food. Uh, I, I will call them the role governed uh, concepts about food. And I will give you like an example of a minute. So we set up another PhD project uh, uh, with um, uh, also my colleague in France and also the collaboration of Ellen Markman in Stanford uh, uh, at the Department of uh, Psychology. Um, and uh, in that project, we wanted to, um, to explore what we call the thematic or script categories about food that are non-taxonomic. So I, I don't know if you are familiar with that terminology. Uh, script are also uh, called sometimes a slot fillers category. So for instance, uh, you might be tempted to, um, uh, for instance, if I show you, uh, I don't know, a, a croissant, a, a cup of coffee, scrambled eggs, uh, maybe sausages, you might refer to this object as breakfast food, right? Even if from a taxonomic point of view, these entities fall into different taxons, right? It means that you, you categorize this object by referring to a, a kind of a, a spatial temporal context like a, the breakfast, which is a particular moment for, for, for consuming food, okay? And it's the, the relation to that context that, uh, um, serve as the essential feature for your uh, script category of breakfast food. 
are, uh, for instance, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, stuff you find in during Eastern or so, during Easter, like, uh, I don't know, chocolate, bells in France, any, any, this kind of thing. Or Halloween, you can group a, a, a witch, a pumpkin together, and maybe some, uh, I don't know, uh, these guys are, well, the, the kind of thing we find in Halloween, right? Piece of furniture, but also food item, only because they feature in the very same context, okay? So these are script categories. And you have also the thematic categories that are slightly different. The thematic categories is the, the kind of combination that occur because there is some functional complementarity between two entities. So you have two entities belonging to very different taxonomic categories, but you tend to categorize them um, uh, because they, they share some, uh, some kind of functional relation. For instance, if I show you a cat, a dog, and a leash, you might be tempted to group the dog and the leash, even if uh, the dog and the cat uh, uh, falls into the same taxonomic category because the dog and the leash, well, it goes nicely together because of some kind of functional complementarity, okay? Or I don't know, within the food domain, you, you might have like uh, boiled eggs and soldiers or this kind of thing. So we wanted to see if the development of these bizarre uh, context-dependent uh, categories uh, was some was predictive of the intensity of food rejection as well, like taxonomic categories. So just because I, I know that you philosophers, you, you like definition, I wanted to give you like a more uh, uh, explicit um, a definition of uh, thematic knowledge of the thematic concepts. So thematic knowledge, uh, it is based on external or complementary associations between objects, events, people, and entities, dog and a leash, okay. And thematic categories, they might be spatial, like for instance, the, the soup is served um, with uh, croutons. Functional, the soup is served in a bowl. So you can categorize soup and a bowl together because the, the, there is this kind of functional relation. Or temporal, for instance, dessert uh, comes after the, the main course, okay? Uh, from a, an even more theoretical point of view, you might be tempted to, to see the thematic categories as a role governed. So uh, this idea of role governed categories is the, uh, this idea that to, to properly conceptualize these categories, you need to focus on external structure of categories rather than on their internal structure, as generally we, we do for, for taxonomic concepts or taxonomic categories. So these categories, they have the specificity of specifying the relation role, the relational role they play uh, um, that is played by category members. Okay. So how do we test that? So for instance, we, we conducted this uh, bizarre uh, proportional analogy, analogy task in uh, young children. So we, we introduced a, a pair of uh, stimuli here, uh, um, a cone, a wafer cone and uh, an ice cream. And we told the kid, uh, well, this pointing to the wafer cone goes with this pointing to the ice cream. Why do these two things go together? So we asked the kid to extract the uh, thematic relation by explaining why these things go, go together, right? So it was the first uh, uh, phase of the, the test. And then uh, we introduced a, a triad. Uh, so with three uh, stimuli, a target and two potential matches. And we uh, told the kids in the same way that this pointing to the wafer cone goes with this pointing to the ice cream, which of these two pointing to the tart and pointing to the orange goes with this pointing to the strawberry. And if the kid succeeded at extracting the thematic category, then he should pair the strawberry with the, the tart uh, and inhibit the taxonomic relation uh, between the strawberry and the orange because they are both fruit, okay? 
And we did that for the thematic, and we did that for the taxonomic. And we wanted to see if the thematic reasoning performance was uh, were um, related to the expression of the, the neophobic behavior. So we kind of confirmed it, but uh, to, to be completely honest with you, uh, it was a significant relation, but uh, a, a very weak one compared to the relation between the taxonomic categories and the, the, the food projection score we obtained in our first experiment. But still, it was a, a, a piece of evidence that uh, thematic knowledge also matters when it comes to predict the, the food rejection in, in young children, okay? But uh, as I told you, uh, in addition to the, the thematic concepts, we have another subfamily of concepts that are the script concepts. So we pursue the investigation of the role governed categories by testing uh, script knowledge uh, in young children, again, as a predictor of neophobia. So how do we did that? Before uh, giving you like the, the, the design, I wanted to explicit about the, the, the definition of the scripts. Uh, the, the, the scripts are the slot fillers categories. They are sometimes called that way. So scripts are formed uh, through a, a categorizing object uh, based on a shared event script or schema representation. For instance, Halloween or breakfast. And um, Simon Wynn and uh, Gregory Murphy state that the script categories are formed when items play the same role in a script, such as bread or uh, cereal at uh, breakfast. Okay. So here is what we did. So the, the, the stimuli are, are sometimes a bit bizarre because we constructed that material for testing American children. So they are bizarre food stimuli because you know how American food is sometimes a bit bizarre from a European point of view. So for instance, to, to, to illustrate the, the, the even script knowledge, we used uh, this pair between a typical birthday cake. So it's a, it's a bizarre cake with a hole in the middle where they put some ice cream for strange reasons. And a, a birthday hat. Okay. Uh, we used another uh, type of uh, script knowledge, which is the meal script knowledge. So it's the it's also a script like referring to a particular event, but within the food domain. So uh, we tested, for instance, uh, breakfast or dinner or a snack, and we illustrated this uh, event by pairs of stimuli. Here you have a pair illustrating the, the dinner script. And um, we also manipulated two thematic relations. Uh, so you, you remember the thematic relations like uh, with this kind of functional complementarities within the food domain, for instance, the relation between a burger bun and a burger patty, and a, a cross domain between a food utensil and a, a, a food item, like for instance, the relation between a cheese grater and a, a, a cheese. So we, we had like, both condition, script and uh, thematic, in uh, within the food domain or cross domain, like mixing artifact and, uh, and and food items, just to see if it if there was something specific to the food or if it could also affect like some food related relation, but mixing artifact and, and food items. And the, the design was very simple. We, for instance, we introduced like a, 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 a triad, like uh, the one on the top left. Uh, so the question uh, here is the birthday. Uh, uh, here is a. You see this cake. Would you eat this cake at a party or at a baseball uh, event? And if you master like the the, the script knowledge, uh, baseball. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, birthday party, you will, of course, pair the uh, cake with the, this hat. It's the same for the food food combination, which is a thematic one within the food domain. Uh, you will pair the burger patty with the burger bun and, and so on and so forth. And so, so we first piloted this experiment on 32 children in, um, in, uh, in the US to see if uh, each type of knowledge could follow a different developmental path. Which one comes earlier? If you prefer, you can phrase it that way. 
And so here, here is what we observed. Uh, so we observed no significant difference for older kids from uh, four and a half to five and a half. But for younger kids, uh, there were like differences, developmental differences uh, between the, the, the condition that can be master like the thematic pairs earlier than the, the, the script knowledge. It means that the representation of what breakfast is or what a dinner is or what a birthday party is seems a, a bit more demanding uh, than uh, the ability to group like uh, items uh, because of some functional complementarity. Probably it was kind of expected. I mean, uh, maybe uh, the reason why it's not that demanding to pair a cheese with a cheese grater is because there are some functional affordances if we want to use like the Gibsonian terminology. So, but still, it, it was nice to, to evidence this. And then we replicated this experiment uh, in uh, in France. So the, the 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 thing that is really annoying when you investigate like role governed categories like script and thematic is that the, the they are super cultural dependent uh, uh, mental representations. For instance, uh, uh, you you might have a very typical thematic relation between peanut butter and jelly in the US. Okay, but this relation just doesn't make any sense from a French point of view. So we had to change all the material. Okay, it's the reason why it's so difficult to conduct like cross-cultural study on these uh, uh, categories because you have to change the material according to the, the what is typical in a particular cultural area. But of course, we pre-tested all this material with adults to measure like familiarity, typicality of the pairs we wanted to manipulate, but still there were at the end uh, different uh, stimuli. And we kind of replicated the, the, our findings regarding the, the development of uh, each types of uh, knowledge in children. And we evidenced a different developmental um, path for uh, especially uh, the meal script versus, for instance, the, 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 thematic, uh, the thematic relations, food, food or food utensil. Okay. Uh, and we replicated again because, you, you know, in cognitive psychology, we are kind of obsessed by conceptual replication because we are not, well, it's uh, tricky to do like strict replication, like doing exactly the same thing. But still, we, we want to conceptually replicate the, the, our findings. So we also uh, uh, test this in another experiment with this um, paradigm, for instance. Uh, we introduced a character. Uh, his name was uh, Cronus, and Cronus is having lunch, but there is no more pasta. Is a croissant, a quiche, or a bolognese sauce more normal to have for lunch instead? So when you say uh, normal to have for lunch instead, um, you are asking about uh, an acceptable substitute, and it's a property of the members of a script uh, category to be uh, substitutable the one to the other. You have this substituability uh, relation that you cannot find in the thematic condition. For instance, there is no point uh, substituting a leash to a dog. Okay, if the if the dog uh, just um, uh, well after an accident the dog is dead, you cannot tell your kid well use the leash instead. To, to, okay, but uh, of course if there is no more pasta left, you can have a instead it's completely acceptable so so the nature of the logical relation within each uh, subcategory thematic and script are, are kind of different so we use this relation to prime the the the, the condition to the to the kid and for instance with the thematic it was very different um it was something like Pepe, another character is having pasta for lunch but what normally would we eat with pasta so we are introducing like an idea of a complementarity, a croissant, a quiche, or a bolognese sauce. And if the kid is uh, mastering the thematic knowledge, he will pair the pasta with the, the bolognese sauce. Okay. And again, um, we observe like a, a developmental um, effect age uh, significantly uh, was predictive of uh, appropriate thematic and script uh, selection. 
and uh, phobiophobia was kind of linked with uh, the appropriate use of thematic and script knowledge. So we uh, confirm our hypothesis that uh, in addition to taxonomic knowledge about food, uh, role governed categories are also important when it comes to predict certain complex facets of food behavior. Okay, so, so just to wrap up, we uh, had a robust replication that script and thematic knowledge in the food domain improves significantly between three and se seven years of age. And there are uh, developmental differences in script and thematic substructures. So it's also something that is very debated in the literature on, about the conceptual development. What comes first? Uh, script maybe because they are undifferentiated uh, situation. Then uh, Catherine Nelson in the 70s uh, defended something like that. Or maybe the thematic because uh, it's easier to master because of some functional affordances mechanism. Well, it's uh, something that could fit these, uh, these discussions. But uh, what I wanted to conclude with is that uh, for you as philosophers, um, I see these uh, results of um, as confirming a, a claim that has been made uh, recently by um, by someone I, I will mention uh, in the next slide. Our findings revealed an apparent variety of food concepts, right? Because we evidence like the development and different type of development of taxonomic thematic and script concepts. I don't know if I'm right to call these constructs concepts, by the way. That's something we can also discuss about. Discuss about. But these types of uh, knowledge structures, let's say, they, they seem to follow slightly different developmental path. Uh, evidence has been obtained uh, about distinct uh, neural systems for taxonomic and thematic knowledge. So uh, about the, the cognitive underpinnings, they, they seem to have different cognitive underpinnings or neural underpinnings. And these uh, uh, subtypes of knowledge, they seem to predict particular behaviors to a different extent. Some of them are strong predictors. Some of them are just uh, uh, kind of uh, moderately uh, related to the, the behavior I was mentioning. And also from a more functional uh, perspective, these uh, concepts or these uh, conceptual uh, uh, knowledge structures, they are characterized by different structure. Uh, certain are, are characterized by hierarchical kind of structure. Some other are more characterized by role governed uh, principles. And they also have uh, uh, different uh, category membership conditions. So why I'm saying this because uh, I think our findings seem consistent with what uh, Edouard Mashri uh, called the heterogeneity hypothesis in his book. Um, I think it's um, Doing Without Concepts, right? Uh, so he said in the preci of his book, uh, the class of concepts divides into several kinds that have little in common. The distinct theories of concepts that characterize these kinds of concepts will account for different phenomena. And uh, what is uh, interesting from a philosophy whole point of view is that Mashri used this argument, among others, but this argument in particular, to put forward that concepts should be eliminated from the cognitive scientist vocabulary. So it's a very provocative claim. And I, I think uh, philosophers in, interested in the food domain has uh, maybe a contribution to, to, to make to this debate because the food domain is especially liable to cross-classification. Like it, it is, uh, the food domain is characterized by the fact that we are constantly switching from one conceptual knowledge structure to another, depending on the context demands. So it's a, it's a perfect example to illustrate the, the heterogeneity uh, hypothesis. And maybe a research program from a philosophical perspective on the variety of food concepts or what look like food concepts uh, could uh, contribute to this uh, recent uh, philosophical uh, debate. So that, that's just a thought I want to share with you. And here are like, a couple of references to, to, to I used during my, my presentation. And I wanted to thank you for your attention. I have other stuff also, but um, I stopped here for the sake of time. <laughs>